If you want to win some expert coaching for your football team... What was your worst defeat, Andrew? Um, you'll have to get past the professionals. If you want to be famous, you'll have to be shrewd. Now, we've got three eligible bachelors. Which one is the millionaire? And if you want to swim with dolphins, first you've got to ride one. Whatever you want, the only show that gives you exactly what you want. Saturday at 7 on BBC One. Possums in a factory near you, spilling the beans. I feel like a truck driver's breakfast. Taking questions. Is the money of your life? Well, there are a few men in my life. But I believe in safety and numbers. Offering beauty tips. Looking like me is going to enlarge your potential. Helped by my lovely assistant, she was Miss New Zealand. <laughs> Join me, David, for my work experience this Thursday at 10 on BBC One. A reunion in 20 minutes, but it's not altogether a happy one in EastEnders. The main evening news, first on BBC One with Peter Sissons at ten past eight. John Major has tonight written to every Conservative constituency association to try to limit the damage of the Cash for Questions affair. He says he can't force any candidate to stand down, but he'd support the use of Parliament's draconian powers against any MP found guilty. Blanket security in the United States as they start selecting a jury for the Oklahoma bombing trial. And the sandbank in the Firth of Forth becomes the last resting place of Moby the Whale. Good evening. John Major has tonight stepped in to try to defuse, as a campaign issue, the cash for questions allegations. He's written to every Conservative constituency association, telling them, in effect, if they elect an MP who is subsequently criticised by the official inquiry, he will support the use of Parliament's draconian powers against the offender. But the Prime Minister says he can't speed up the report or impose a new candidate on a constituency which has chosen one of the MPs against whom allegations have been made. Meantime, the Labour leader, Tony Blair, said he wanted a positive campaign that would rise above sleaze. Our political correspondent, Jeremy Vine, reports. <laughs> This is as close as Labour get to triumphalism these days, a rather modest wind and string outfit at a rather modest party shindig in Kent. And while the Prime Minister was drawing up his letter on scandal-hit MPs, Labour were publicly drawing back from the issue. Now! These posters, they claim, will turn the election away from sleaze. I have issued instructions now that all our posters between now and May the 1st election day will be positive. They will tell this country how we can make Britain better. They won't be running our opponents ragged. Some would say the Conservatives are doing that to themselves. Within hours, the ex-minister Neil Hamilton and other Tory MPs accused of so-called sleaze were back in the frame. Not because of anything the opposition had said, but because of the Prime Minister's letter. It mentions the unpublished Downey report into the MPs. And then Mr Major says, although he's been asked to release it, I can't. I don't have it. It isn't mine to publish. Critically, having made remarks suggesting he'd like at least one Tory MP not to stand, Mr Major now stresses the selection of the candidate is the responsibility of the local association. The decision to contest the seat is for the candidate. Labour couldn't resist accusing the Prime Minister of dithering and the Liberal Democrats laid in too. Will he show the leadership to make clear the sort of people who are fit to take part in public life and the sort who are not? As soon as he does that, we can all get on to the real issues of the health education, crime and the economy. With his letter, Mr Major is trying to fulfil those demands, saying severe punishment will be necessary for MPs who are found guilty. The problem is that his timetable does not allow for a verdict this side of the election. The issue of so-called sleaze is proving almost impossible to shut down. Jeremy Vine, BBC News, Westminster. Firefighters investigating the deaths of two scout leaders in a rockfall in Shropshire say the accident may have been triggered by heat from their campfire. Stuart Perkins and David Weaver were on a trip to Clearbury Mortimer with 12 scouts from Kidderminster. No one else was hurt. 
The campsite remains sealed off today, the rocky embankment still to be declared safe. Only flowers now mark the spot where the two scout leaders were crushed by falling rocks. In the early hours of this morning, firefighters worked to recover the trapped bodies. A digger was brought in to lift the huge slabs of stone which fell on the young men. They were enjoying a drink round the campfire when the rock face collapsed. The 12 young scouts had sat with them in the cave just hours before. Scout leader Marcus Hill managed to escape and raise the alarm. Still clearly in shock, he spoke at a news conference about the loss of his friends. We actually um, sat around the fire, just talking, and without warning, the, uh, the rocks from above just, just fell on us. No warning whatsoever. 20-year-old Stuart Perkins and 21-year-old David Weaver were experienced and dedicated volunteers. Their families can't believe what's happened. It was his life. He lived for the Scouts. That's all he did. His main interest was the Scouts. The 12 Scouts, none of whom was injured, are now being offered counselling. A tragic accident at their Easter holiday camp. Emma Simpson, BBC News. Police in Nottinghamshire have said they're treating an attack on a German family near Sherwood Forest as racially motivated. Four teenagers stopped the family's Mercedes car and shouted anti-German abuse before attacking the driver, his wife and one of their sons. The family were released from hospital after treatment. Labour's education spokesman David Blunkett has warned teachers that a Labour government would not allow union militants to stand in the way of his proposals to raise standards in the classroom. Mr Blunkett also put before the National Union of Teachers in conference at Harrogate details of Labour's plan to improve the standard of maths in schools. But the Education Secretary Gillian Shepherd said a strategic plan was already in place and Labour was running to catch up and failing miserably. Our education correspondent Mike Baker reports. This conference has been piling high its demands for any future Labour government. For more money, smaller classes and an end to league tables and grammar schools. It's also threatened possible strike action to support these aims. But David Blunkett, who's been given a hostile reception here in the past, made it plain that while he wanted partnership, not conflict, he would not jump to union demands. We will not tolerate division or bullying or threats, not simply from those who attend union conferences, but from anyone who has a vested interest in any part of our country. Replying, the union's leader said the NUT wouldn't drop the right to strike where pupils or teachers' needs weren't being met, but he also offered partnership. This union doesn't seek conflict nor confrontation. It seeks partnership. Partnership with a government that shares its ideals and its philosophy. Mr Blunkett also announced Labour's plans for raising standards in maths. They include setting national targets for numeracy skills, more focus on traditional teaching methods like learning tables by heart, and less use of calculators in primary school. But Conservatives said they were already doing this. A few weeks ago, the Prime Minister and I announced the setting of targets for all schools uh, so that uh, parents and others could see the performance of schools in literacy and numeracy. As usual, Mr Blunkett seems to have missed the boat. All of this work is in hand. If you've got people going round suggesting good ideas of how to improve literacy and numeracy, that has to be welcomed. But if you don't at the same time back that up with the promise to make sure that every single teacher is going to get the tools they need to do the job, the smaller class sizes and the opportunities for effective in-service support, then by itself the task force is not going to deliver the high literacy and numeracy standards we need from all young people. David Blunkett will be pleased that he's delivered a tough message and still received a polite reception here. But the teachers have made it clear they still expect big educational changes from whoever forms the next government. Mike Baker, BBC News, Harrogate. The trial of one of the men accused of the Oklahoma bombing has begun in Denver amid extraordinary security precautions. 168 people were killed in the attack on a federal building in 1995. A Gulf War veteran, Timothy McVeigh, has pleaded not guilty to the charges. Our correspondent Bill Turnbull is at the trial. 
all eyes in Denver on the man with perhaps the toughest job in any U.S. courtroom, Stephen Jones, lawyer for Timothy McVeigh, supporting a defendant already described in the press as an all-American monster in the face of what the prosecution claims is a mountain of compelling evidence. There's been so much publicity about the case that the proceedings were moved to Denver from the scene of the crime 500 miles away after a judge ruled that McVeigh could not get a fair hearing in Oklahoma. The prisoner himself was hustled into the city at the weekend under cover of darkness to be housed in a cell beneath the federal courthouse for the duration of the trial which could result in a death sentence. Outside, the police have left nothing to chance, welding down manhole covers and securing the building behind a ring of concrete barriers and surveillance cameras. The first task in court, choosing a jury, is highly important strategically, and here the prosecution has a built-in advantage. We know it's a pro-prosecution jury because they had to get death qualified. In order to serve as a juror in a death penalty case in the United States, you have to say that you're willing to impose the death penalty. And people who say they mor are morally opposed, they're out. The prosecution contends that McVeigh was the prime mover in a simple conspiracy to blow up the Murrow building, motivated by a murderous hatred of his country's government. The defense version reads like a spy thriller, their client caught in a web of intrigue involving neo-Nazis and Iraqi terrorists with the detonator for the bomb supplied by the IRA. Choosing 12 jurors and six substitutes from a pool of nearly 400 can be a slow process and it could take two to three weeks. The trial itself is expected to last well into the summer. Bill Turnbull, BBC News, Denver. Here, the first parade of Northern Ireland's marching season has passed off peacefully. The Protestant apprentice boys decided to change one of their routes to avoid the mainly Catholic Lower Orma Road, a move welcomed by the nationalists. Last year's parade ended in riots. Two teenage boys have died after being hit by a passenger train on the main Trans-Pennine route near Leeds. The train from Middlesbrough to Manchester Airport was travelling at 70 miles an hour. A third boy who was near the track at the time of the, of the accident was unhurt. He's been questioned by police. Israel has condemned the Arab League's decision to suspend normal ties with its government and revive an economic boycott. The League acted after Israel decided to go ahead with a new settlement in East Jerusalem. Earlier, Israeli troops demolished the home of a Palestinian suicide bomber. The villagers of Zorif were confined to their homes in case of trouble when the bulldozer started to demolish the home of Musa Neymat, the bomber who killed himself and three Israeli women in Tel Aviv. Israel believes this will deter other suicide attacks. Human rights groups condemn the demolition as an unjust collective punishment because it leaves Neymat's widow and four children homeless. Israel deployed tanks on the West Bank over the weekend, and action Yasser Arafat called a declaration of war. He returned from the Arab League meeting in Cairo, well pleased with its moves to isolate Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu condemned them. A nation has to take a stand, and we cannot accept a concept of peace in which we are coerced by political warfare, or by the threats of terror, by the threats of violence. After almost a fortnight of riots, peace talks have stopped and show no signs of being restarted. But this morning, at the Israeli checkpoint outside Bethlehem, there were signs of hope. Palestinian school children, nine and ten-year-olds, were going on their own peace mission to see children of the same age at an Israeli school in Jerusalem. The Israeli children, many of them consider Palestinian children as terrorists, while the children are children everywhere. The idea was to change both sides' preconceptions. It seemed to work. Some of the Israelis had never even met Palestinians. They seem very nice kids. You surprised? Yes, I'm, I'm surprised. Uh, I didn't imagine them like how they are. What did you think they might be like? I don't know, pushy, sort of, you know, like fighty, sort of. Of course, this was a symbolic exercise, but it was also about the brightest moment in the last fortnight. Jeremy Bowen, BBC News, Jerusalem. The new body set up to investigate claims of miscarriages of justice has officially taken over the job from the Home Office. Now the Criminal Cases Review Commission will decide whether to refer convictions to the Court of Appeal. It's now six years since the Birmingham Six were freed by the Court of Appeal. The government immediately set up a review of the criminal justice system, and that in turn led to the new review commission, which starts looking at cases from today. 
The Home Office has transferred around 180 suspected miscarriages of justice to the new body. The Criminal Cases Review Commission has been in existence since the beginning of this year, but the chairman and 13 members have so far declined all invitations to speak about their work. Lawyers can now start submitting cases to the Commission. In fact, anyone can ask for a case to be reviewed, although normally there has to be new evidence. This will be one of the first. Derek Bentley tried to burgle a warehouse in South London in 1952. His accomplice, Christopher Craig, who had a gun, fired the shots which killed Constable Sidney Miles. On trial at the Old Bailey, Bentley was said to have encouraged Craig to shoot with the words, let him have it, Chris. Bentley was executed at Wandsworth Prison, although Craig was too young to hang. The Bentley family solicitor is confident that the new Criminal Cases Review Commission will make a better job of investigating Derek Bentley's case. I think they're bound to look at things uh, in a much less bureaucratic way than the officials in the Home Office. Um, they're not going to be weighed down with masses of other cases and so on. The, always the problem, you're always told at the Home Office, they didn't have the, the staff to deal with these miscarriage cases. They were put at the bottom of a line. The Commission can't clear anybody, but Mr Bernberg hopes it will use its powers to refer Derek Bentley's case back to the Court of Appeal. That way, the judges will decide. Joshua Rosenberg, BBC News. A 40-foot sperm whale which became stranded in the Firth of Forth has died. Nicknamed Moby, the whale resisted all attempts to drive him back to the open sea over the past 12 days and was discovered trapped on a mudflat earlier today. It was 10 days ago that Moby was first sighted in the Firth of Forth. Experts thought he'd become lost during migration. On three separate occasions, concerted efforts were made to usher the whale into the deeper, safer waters of the North Sea. But with those who'd taken part, thinking they'd succeeded, today locals from the village of Earth, further upriver from the first sightings, saw the whale beached. Well, we're looking at the bedroom under, and um, we thought we could see what, well, it was what we thought was the whale. And we got the binoculars out, and uh, we could see it sprouting the water out, so we got the kids out of bed, half past eight, and we came down. But as onlookers started to surround the mudflats, the sperm whale died at around one o'clock. It's, it's really, it's, it's a new situation every time you encounter one of these things. It's difficult to know exactly the best way to handle it. Uh, we can't get vehicles or anything down to the, to the beach at the minute, so uh, it may well have to be towed elsewhere. It's now the task of local authorities and other interested parties to discuss who'll be responsible for removing the remains. The whale weighed around 40 tonnes. Alan Mackay, BBC News, on the Firth of Forth. And that's all from the newsroom tonight. Good night. Good evening. Now the main stories from the Look North newsroom. Rail track has launched an investigation after two teenagers died when they were hit by a train on the outskirts of Leeds. The accident happened late last night at Cross Gates, where the Selby Road crosses the line. The two teenage boys were struck by the Middlesbrough to Manchester Airport train at about a quarter to ten last night. The passenger train was travelling at 70 miles an hour at the point the boys were hit. One was killed instantly, the other died shortly afterwards. Earlier, three boys had been seen throwing stones at cars from a bridge on the main Transpennine route. When the police arrived, the bodies of a 13 and 15-year-old were found on the track. They should know better. But having said that, you know, if, if they've got nothing else to do, um, they're obviously looking for what they might consider an adventure. But it's a very, very dangerous adventure, as, as last night's shows. Rail track have targeted 1,300 schoolchildren, repeating the warnings that the railway is no place to play. Over the Easter period alone, more than 52 cases of trespass have been reported just in this area. They're the reported incidents of trespass on the railway. It's a very big problem. It's obviously not purely a rail track problem. It's one we need to work with the community, with families, with schools and with the police. The driver of the train has been given time off. Meanwhile, the police investigation is continuing and police officers would like to hear from any car drivers who may have seen the events leading up to the tragic incident.
29-year-old man from Sheffield has been stabbed in the head and neck at a block of flats in Jordanthorpe. His condition in hospital is said to be stable. His attackers, described as white, around 19 years old, 6 feet tall and stocky. West Yorkshire police have gone back to traditional military-style drill to help smarten up their bobbies on the beat. New recruits are now being taught deportment. We are going to do a few minutes drill in threes and elementary drill. Pay attention. Red, sharp. Now the forceful to tones of Tom Butler welcome West Yorkshire's police tower. officers of the future in their first week of training. A former soldier who served more than 30 years in the police, he's been brought out of retirement to smarten up today's new recruits. If this officer who's going to do the job if he looks like a police officer, if he's smart, active, clean, I will put a proposition that he is a long way to bring him to a conclusion whatever matter he's dealing with. I'm quite taken back and almost frightened at first, but um, as we got to know him, he's been, he's been great. When this group of probationers take their gleaming shoes and smartly pressed uniforms out on the beach, the words of Tom Butler will still be ringing in their ears. That's all from us for this evening. We'll be back with Look North as usual tomorrow at 6.30 on BBC One. Now the national weather forecast with David Lee. Good evening. Well, today's fine weather come courtesy of this area of high pressure fixed firmly across the southern part of the British Isles. The cold front in the north, that's uh, this area of cloud here. Now, you can see how the clear skies extend the way southwards, right through France into many southwestern parts of Europe during the day. You can also see the extent of the sunshine, how it moved northwards into some eastern parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, through the rest of the evening and overnight, we'll find some of the cloud actually spreading back southwards across Northern Ireland into Cumbria. Many of these western parts of Scotland catching some rain and and some drizzle but further south sky should stay clear but in these southern coastal counties we'll probably see some patches of dense fog forming later on and that could last a good part of the morning now it will be chilly under the clear skies a fairly widespread ground frost temperatures a little bit below freezing in some places but too much wind and too much cloud in the north for temperatures to fall too far now that high still there on Tuesday, a weakening cold front pushing south. And we do count the high in the south, but eventually another cold front will introduce colder weather into the far northeast of Britain during Thursday. So let's uh, start a Tuesday in the south with a good deal of sunshine, but as I say, that fog lasting for some time. Further northwest, a good deal of cloud and some rain and drizzle are likely in the north and the west and part of Scotland. Now I think we're going to find the fog clearing except from the south coast where it may linger into the afternoon and it will brighten up over Northern Ireland and the far north of Scotland. Temperatures tomorrow highest again in the Midlands, 17 Celsius, probably near 13 to 15 in eastern Scotland. That's it from me, a very good night to you. Ray Mears has a go at mastering the art of hunting on the spice islands of Indonesia over on BBC Two now. Two lives. Nobody goes time travelling with a pork pie. <laughs> That's got to be the quickest way to get salmonella. Two loves. A man's got to do what a man's got to do. Not in my house, he doesn't. But is it double the fun? Good night, sweetheart. Moves to Tuesdays from next week on BBC One. Angus Deaton is a man on a mission. Follow me. Brushing the dust off the celebrity archives for the clips that'll make them cringe. Who cares what you once did? Sorry. Mammals. They've been brewing since 1823. <laughs> Who you once were? Hi, my name is Michelle Fiber. I live in Midway City and I represent Orange County. Who remembers those humiliating years in obscurity? Sure, Paris do seem to be going on to things. Before they were famous, in half an hour on BBC One. Perfectly broadcastable entertainment. And first on BBC One, Nigel has an Easter surprise. And it looks nothing like an egg. Easter Bunny. 